Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today is Sue Ryan. She is a best selling author. The book most relevant to all of us is Our Journey of Love Five Steps to Navigating Your Caregiving Journey. So, thank you for joining me today, Sue. Glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. And we're discussing the perfectly imperfect journey and we're navigating transitions, which if that's not my life, I don't know what is, but I think it's everybody's <laughs> life at some point. So why don't you tell us a little bit about you? Your husband, Jack, has Alzheimer's. That's correct. Does, Alzheimer's. Does. Okay, mm -hmm. good. I like it now that brain cells are working better now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I had shingles all summer long and brain fog along with it. And I'm not sure which one was actually worse. So glad that that's mostly behind me now. <laughs> that's in the rear view mirror now. Definitely. Took a little while, right. but brain fog is not fun. <laughs> no. no. So tell, like not. I said, tell me a little bit about you guys. All right. I have been in roles of what they might call non-professional or family-based or unpaid caregiving support for over 35 years now for family and loved ones. And it's included roles with uh, my grandmother and my dad. And now, as you were mentioning, my husband, Jack, and then other loved ones. And so in parallel to that, with my professional life, I was uh, in enterprise application software sales. And the, the integration of what I learned in each of the areas of my life has really given me a perspective. And, and I'm naturally kind of a wired to be a positive person, but the integration of all of those has given me a perspective on how I navigate our caregiving journey. And part of that, it was my, just my strong passion to share what I had learned with other people because I've recognized and I've been told that I have a perspective. Many people don't have access to it. Uh, so that's kind of the, where it came. I've always loved communicating. I've always loved teaching. And so I brought the communicating through writing. I've written the book. Uh, it's one of three international bestsellers. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful. I'm writing a few others. And I took the, the book that I wrote, and I've now created an online course that takes a deeper dive into navigating our caregiving journey. So there we are. And you're still navigating because your husband's still with still us. I am still navigating. Yes, I am. My husband is, he is in what people might call the later stages of Alzheimer's disease. And he lives in a memory care community in the skilled nursing area. And so I navigate the journey as a primary caregiver, a care partner, and a care supporter for him. And was he living in the memory care during COVID? Yes, he was. And Oof. he came, he was diagnosed with COVID during that time. There were a number of people in the community who came down with COVID in a 24 hour period. And he fortunately was one of the residents who didn't, uh, didn't pass away, but he had uh, the kind of the, the lingering effects of it were that because he was um, in intensive care for a week and then in a bed for over six weeks without getting up, he kind of forgot how to get up and he forgot how to stand and he forgot how to walk and sit down. And those were challenging things for him. And so since that period of time, he's chosen not to get up. And so now we, we just make him as comfortable as possible uh, staying in bed and He's perfectly content. So I think that's important because it would be very easy for most people, I think, to think, well, you could do this two months ago. Let's get you back there. I'm not sure that's always possible. And I'm not always sure that it's the right choice, even though it, it probably feels more correct to try to help them get back to where they were than it is to quote unquote, just give up and say, well, I'll just make him as comfortable as possible. But that's why would you think that that's a better choice? I know how I feel, but I'll let you, since you're okay. the one that's dealing with it. Yes. Um, I practice something I call, and we'll probably have a chance to talk about it, but I practice massive acceptance and radical presence. So I, whenever I'm around Jack, I accept fully exactly 100% exactly where he's at 
no judgment, no, gee, he used to be able to do this. And I would love for him to be able to do this. And what will the future be like if he can't do this? None of that. I stay, I accepted 100% and stay really fully, fully present in the moment. And so when we were navigating him trying to um, get up or the, you know, and be supported and, and we saw the angst that he had, we saw that he actually had fear when he was trying to sit down and, and being able to stay present to that. What I recognized is my logical mind might say, well, gee, you know, he's probably weak because he wasn't out of bed, but we can strengthen his legs. He ought to be able to do it. He's, he's always been strong in there, but meeting him where he was at and having the best possible experience for him meant that we allowed him to be comfortable and he was very comfortable not getting up anymore. And I accept that. And we've built his life around that. And we keep him comfortable and happy where he's at. My two goals for him are that he's safe and happy. And he is. That's what I did with my mom, which as most of my listeners know, most of the time meant taking her out to the park to watch kids. So I, I can relate, but I'd never had a challenge like that one. The, the closest I came and it's minor in comparison was this was probably about a month before she broke her leg, which was two and a half weeks before she passed away. So about six and a half, seven weeks before she died, I was with her and the, the benches outside the memory care were far enough apart that I was sitting next to her. And I'm like, I know that she can't really see me if I'm sitting next to her, but I'm either gonna have to drag these heavy benches or something. And I'm, I was trying to puzzle out in my mind what might have been the best choice but she was so quiet and normally she was pretty chatty and yeah. she just, she just seemed somewhere else mentally. And I thought, this is interesting. This is a little different. And so I just sat with her. I did eventually sit in front of her so she could see me. And, you know, it was a quiet, a little bit melancholy visit, maybe not for her, but it was for me. And so it was, I was definitely present, but, oh, it was a little bit, it was a, a little bit challenging to accept. And I, I think that's one of our, I know it's a big, it was, was a big challenge for me is like not being in my logical mind because that is, uh -huh. that is where we like to be. <laughs> so how do you suggest caregivers stop trying to logic through Alzheimer's or dementia? Because I, I know that was my biggest struggle. Like I would, my mom would speak in full sentences with clear English words and no context. And I'd scrunch up my face, like trying to find a clue. As soon as I did that face scrunching, immediately she was angry at me. So I, she interpreted yeah. face scrunching in confusion as a negative thing, even though it really wasn't. So I had to learn just to just go with it. Just like, oh, okay, sure. Yeah. Which was hard because it's my mom and I didn't want to just fluff her on like I was paying attention when I was, but I had no idea what she was talking about. So whatever I responded with, I didn't want her to be upset that right. I didn't respond appropriately. Uh -huh. So I was like, it was like a constant battle in my head. Just go along with what she's quote unquote saying, but no, I don't want to make her upset by not responding appropriately. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only caregiver that's ever felt like that. No, you're not. We all, we all do that. There, you know, for me, there, there are three things that I focus on with that. One of them is, uh, and I, I created a, a process I call the caregiver's journey. And it talks about the journey that we go through from like before the, the journey begins, when we know caregiving is on the horizon or right when it comes all the way through when we're moving forward after the grieving process. The second phase in it is called the journey begins with me. One of the things that we don't necessarily do is understand our personalities, understand ourselves in a meaningful way. We don't know how we naturally deal with stress. We don't know how, you know, where our resilience and our strength are because most of what we do in our lives is highly unconscious to us. So one of the things I invite people into the consideration of is how to have us understand where we naturally have the best opportunity for us to experience the journey, where we're, where we're going to naturally be able to communicate with them, 
based on um, how we naturally deal with stress and where we're probably going to want to have support because of things that, where we've got gaps in what we do things. So I help people understand about their personalities and raise back to their level of awareness. The second thing is, is that so often, and I'm sure you've seen this a, a lot, is that people, you know, I didn't go to school to become a caregiver. I didn't go to school to study neurocognitive disorders. All of a sudden, there's a diagnosis and we're caregivers. And so you're, you, you, you know, you went Monday, everything was fine. And Tuesday, you want a PhD and whatever the diagnosis is, and you want a PhD in caregiving. And there's so much to learn and it's overwhelming. And so one of the things that happens is that somebody will tell us something and we'll take that on as a truth. We'll create a label based on their experience, not based on ours. Many, many, many people who are in roles of caregiving have created the lens of how they see the caregiving experience through the lens of other people's experiences who've said, and, and I've got a quick example. Uh, there was a doctor who, um, psychiatrist who I interviewed, she wanted to see Jack and I couldn't understand why she would want to see my husband. He's in memory care. Why does a psychiatrist want to see him? So I wanted to meet with her first and, and her, you know, she had more letters after her name than there are letters in the alphabet. So she's, you know, person of authority, all that stuff. And she starts off and, and I wrote this down so I'd remember it. And I remember the, the thing. She goes this horrible, dreadful, debilitating disease. Now, that is a person of authority. And I could very easily have taken on, and I've seen other people have done, that would be the lens through which I would see the disease. So often as we're learning about it, and we don't know any better, but we pick up from other people our perspective on the disease instead of, and this is the third part, staying absolutely fully present and accepting, okay, this is what it is. This is what it is. This is where we at. we're at. My logical mind wishes it could be that way. And my logical mind isn't going to be able to get us where we need to go. The only place we have access to learning new things is in the present moment. So if I'm able to fully accept it and stay radically present, I can observe what my care receiver has access to, like your mom. You can observe her eyes are scrunching. You could also observe if you were sitting there that as she saw a butterfly fly by, she got a smile on her face. And you might want to put butterflies in a room or things like that. So we're able to see with emotions that are not clouded by what other people have said that were labels. We don't take on their labels. We have our own authentic relationship. We have our emotions and we're present in the moment. We're not projecting in the future and we're not trying to pull in the past to try to recreate it. That makes sense. And it's interesting because I was thinking about this this morning <clears throat> while I was getting dressed was actually listening to a short blurb from Tipa Snow and on her gems and the gem states Yes, and not labeling people, not using the gem state as a label, but as a description mm -hmm. for certain, you know, circumstances. And I thought, you know, the younger, the millennial caregivers seem to be better at not putting a label on their loved one, their parents, generally a parent, sometimes a grandparent. And I'm wondering, wondering if just, you know, we have these shifts in our societal thinking, you know, like it used to be acceptable to refer to, you know, all oh, that, that white woman over there, or that blonde chick that likes to wear pink. But now we don't talk that way because it's not inclusive. It's not acceptable. And I've, I've learned to change the way I des describe people. And it's not always easy when you don't live in a very diverse community to the most obvious trait may not be the one that you want to point out because it's not it's not considered appropriate anymore. And I think the millennials do that better because they don't have 30 years to unlearn like some of us do or more. So I think that's yeah. really interesting. Not not taking on somebody else's labels. Well, I'm going to have to. That one's going to go through my head for a little while until you tell me something else really cool. <laughs> well, and it's easy to raise it to your level of awareness. You know, you, you'll catch yourself. Um, do you want me to give you a quick example of one way of one that's that many of us have? Yeah, definitely. OK. In in our lives, when we're young children and people of authority are guiding us and teaching us, one of the things they'll say 
you, you do something wrong. Like when we're, we're, we're unquenchably curious and we're trying things, sometimes they work out well, sometimes not so good. So we do something wrong and our, our parents or someone else, teachers would say, you're sorry, say, I'm sorry. You did, that was wrong. Say, I'm sorry. We get used to saying, I'm sorry. And as life goes on, when something goes wrong, may, we may not have had anything to do with it. We are so unconscious behavior. We're so used to saying, I'm sorry, when something goes wrong, that if, for example, you were to say to me, you know, I, I just received a cancer diagnosis and I say, oh, I'm sorry, then I, I'm, I'm mechanically, unconsciously saying, I'm sorry. That's not the right word to use. It's a label for something where you're showing an emotion. It's not the right emotion to serve the experience. It, it checks off a box, but you haven't really engaged. And it's, and it makes it harder to engage because, you know, you've said you received a diagnosis. Well, I, I'm apologizing. I had nothing to do with it. When, if you were conscious of it and that wasn't your just automatic behavior, you may have been able to say, this must must be a, a, a time of a great amount of change in your life. What could I be doing to support you? Could I run errands for you? Would you like me to come sit with you? What can I do to help you? You know, how can I be supporting you? So you're able to have a more meaningful, authentic conversation that's accurate for that, not use a label where you've checked the box from an unconscious comment. And then they, they're like, okay, well, they said something and I don't know what to respond to to that. They're apologizing. I, they did nothing wrong. And I don't know what to say back to that. So I'm just going to move on. Yeah, you get into those rote answers, like somebody may say, oh, I'm so, I'm so sorry to hear about your husband, Jack. Is there anything I can do to help? And we're almost trained to say, oh, no, that's okay. Thank you. And I've taught, tried to teach people, hope I've taught people, that especially early on in the diagnosis, early on in the caregiving, before you're like overwhelmed, is to make yes. a list of all of your daily tasks that need to be done, weekly tasks, monthly tasks. So obviously that takes a little bit of time. While you're making the list of all the stuff that you do all the time, make a list of everybody you know and what you think their most, their best trait is, as in like, what 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 is it that they can handle? Like, don't ask Jennifer to talk to the bank because Jennifer don't like that and she doesn't handle it very well. But I can cook and bake and do other things. You know, I can take you, your husband to the park if he wants to watch children. I can handle all that. Don't ask me to call the insurance company. And then when, you know, you, I say, you know, oh, I'm so sorry to hear about your husband, Jack. Is there anything I can do? You can be like, yes, you know, he would love it if you could take him to the park. Instead of saying, can you set up my online banking? Because I would be like, oh, no, uh-uh, you don't want me to do that. Right. <laughs> Well, and no, then you might it's, feel it's, rejected. So it's right. It helps that's, to reframe the thought process. It it does. It and it it also helps for you because you know, again, I'm not sure where you were on this, but you know, I'm I'm you know, I I can do anything. I would just kept adding on and adding on and adding on. And people would say, Do you need any help? No, I got this. Because I didn't want to burden somebody else. I didn't, you know, and I I could do this, and, you know, all those things. The sooner in our caregiving journey where we do what you're talking about, where we embrace other people who want to lean in and help, just like we would want to lean in to help them. And what you're doing, and that's so beautiful, is you're giving them a pathway to know how they can lead, lean in so that they can participate and be supportive and help. And then you understand where they have capacity for Plus what you did that's really, really great is you're not asking them to do something they don't have access to. So they don't have to feel guilty or bad that they can't really help. And it, it can nurture them and make them feel better because most of us really do want to help each other. And it's so, and it's going to be more necessary as the country and the globe keeps aging. There's going to be more of us that need help and more of us that are providing help. And the sooner we can help, <laughs> using that word a lot. As soon as we can teach people how to easily help and not yes. burden people, because we don't want to be, a, none of us wants to be a burden if we need help or if we're caregiving or if we're the person who needs the caring. We don't want to be a burden. That's, a, that's the one thing my mom always said. I don't want to be a burden to you two girls, yeah. but I want to live yeah. forever in my home. <laughs> well, and there's a season. I mean, there's a season when you have capacity in your life 
to lean in and help. And you do want to, and it fills you and it makes you feel good. And then there are seasons where we are on the receiving end of that. And people want to lean in to help us when they have capacity. So I actually was telling somebody one time, you know, it's really selfish. If you don't allow other people when they want to lean in to help, if you don't allow them to help, it's kind of selfish because they really, they care about you and they would like to do something that, that can hear. So, you know, I mean, even if it's a five minute thing, it doesn't matter. You know, make a list of things that somebody, if they said, could you help like you did? I mean, that's a, that's a great suggestion. I learned that from another podcaster whose family pitched in together. They actually formed what they called the care committee and they took care of it. It's complicated because I talked to mom and the son on the podcast. So it was her mother, his grandmother. And what happened was grandpa had been taking care of his wife and he just got to the point where he burned out and he goes, I can't do this anymore. And he told his kids, I need you to find a care home for mom. And so they did that, but they also enlisted the grandchildren to help. And so that's, I'm going to link that episode in the show notes because it's a really good one to go back to if you need to hear it again. But what ended up happening is everybody kind of had their role, the Mm in-town people, the out-of-state people, everybody had a little piece of the pie. So nobody felt overwhelmed and grandma's sister who had never married and never had children also ended up with Alzheimer's. So they, and this is, this is like a quote, they expanded the care committee to include her. Yes. And that in, in this conversation, the grandson, so the, the guy that was the podcaster, he said they basically wanted to somehow formalize this committee, sort of like a board of directors kind of um, legal setup. I mean, they literally were like, that's oh, how wow. they thought about it. I was so impressed. That is why I yeah. share what he taught me mm-hmm, three that's, years ago. <laughs> Yeah, that would be a great thing because what I share in the, my book and what I, what I put some things together for for checklists and ways to put it together in my online course is that I would I would identify like here are things that would take like 15 minutes. Here are things that would be like a half an hour. This might be an hour or half a day. And then if somebody asked if they could help, I would say, you know, what kind of capacity do you have? But I like yours of, of, of understanding ahead of time what kinds of things people might be able to do. But if somebody said, you know, I'd like to help, and I'd say, well, you know, if, if you're running by the dry cleaner, could you pick up the dry cleaner? Or if you're running by the store, please don't make a special trip. But if you're going to be in the store, I could use some milk. So things like that where, where people could participate to their level of capacity. And yet it, it also helped, you know, I felt good. And then it was somebody who was having a conversation with Jack when they got there, and he's a very social person. So it was a win all the way around. It also helps them to engage with your person. And so Great they're point. not thrust into a, oh my God, I need two hours off. Can you come sit with my husband or my mom? And they're yeah. like, um, I don't know how to handle this. Or they yeah. accept the challenge and something happens like there's a bathroom mishap or right. some some new thing pops up and you haven't briefed them on what to do in this scenario. And now they're super uncomfortable and they really don't want to do this again. So now you've like almost trained them not to want to help. So it helps get people involved early so that they, they understand what's going on, what your loved one is dealing with. And, and they're kind of along the journey when you like jam them in, in the middle to later stages when it's harder and they haven't had a lot of experience. I mean, you're just throwing them overboard and hoping they're swimming. And that's not very nice. <laughs> and they're and they're trying to find the ring. No, that's a that's really a great suggestion. Yeah. Well, and it just like there was a gal in my support group. She's like, I would just love it if somebody would come over and sit with me and have tea. And I'm thinking, well, I like tea, but I also know that you have said that your house is a disaster and clutter and disasters stress me out. Like my daughter's house is not is not as neat and tidy and organized as my house. Doesn't mean I don't love her any less, but I'd rather she come over here. Because just the mess stresses me out. So I'm like, I'd love to have tea with you. Could we go out? But that was not 
something she could do very easily. Right. So I always felt guilty because I'm like, I wouldn't mind having tea with you, but I know I would feel stressed. (laughs) There's another label. That's one. So I I talk about three labels, guilt, worry, and sorry that we fall into so often that prevent us from having the correct emotion, which prevent us from having the correct experience because we have a label. Have you ever looked up the definition of the word guilty? No, actually, I don't think I have. No. And so this is a perfect example. We take on the way it's been modeled for us or kind of, you know, we've lived it, but we haven't really looked it up or defined it for ourselves. I became very, very uh, focused on this because in my sales career, if my prospect was using a word and I assumed that my definition of it matched theirs, I could underserve the situation. I could get the, get it wrong. I could make a mistake. So I got very, very specific on making sure I had clarity on my definition of the word. I wasn't using it as a label. And if there was somebody else using the word, I got their definition and we had clarity and we had agreement. So the word guilty is another one of those that we often use as a label. We felt guilty. Well, you know, you might have perhaps, uh, you know, it might have made you feel uncomfortable, but you didn't do anything wrong. You know, guilt is like if, you know, if you had gone and, you know, chopped her hand off, you're guilty of doing that. But, you know, this is where you had an emotion where you felt uncomfortable with it or you wish. And then you have access when you're not using a label or a word that doesn't serve the emotion. You have access to do something about it and then not have that emotion hang with you and hang and weigh on you. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And that's about that's so that's part of especially when we get into things like um, when we're talking about grief. That's how we're able to to clarify that emotion and the power of that emotion and how it's really meant to serve us so that we process it, we go through it, we experience it, and then we're able to move forward instead of having it just hang and weigh us down and stay there and we get stuck and don't know how to get out of it. I'm a little bit stuck because thanks to the pandemic, my mother has never had a celebration of life. And I was hoping that we could do that around the first anniversary of her passing. We were still dealing with COVID and now we're still dealing with COVID. And this is September of 2021. Almost forget the year because last year barely counted. (laughs) And I had a guest, I believe it was a guest, suggest that I do like a celebration of life Mother's Day tea. And I'm like, I love that idea because I used to have my mom, my neighbor, my nana. And my daughter and I would do tea. My minus the neighbor, we used to go to a tea house and it was noisy. And the noise bothered my mom, understandably. It was it was kind of a too much noise. Sometimes we'd sit outside, but mid-May, early May and in, in California isn't always that warm. Not in Northern California anyway. So one year I was just like, this is expensive. It is not fun for me. I'm the one paying for it, so I'm just going to do it at home. And my my lovely dear Nana, who lived to be 103, oh, wow. she told me, I enjoyed this so much more than the tea house. And I thought, you have got to be kidding me. <laughs> like spending like $250 to take the four of us to tea. And you liked my home done version better. Okay, we will be doing the homespun version from yeah. now on. And I liked it better because... I would make more tea sandwiches and like two sweets instead of four. Anybody that's done a tea, high tea knows that there's not a lot of filling foods. You can fill up on carbs and sugar and junk, but that doesn't serve my body well. And I would make homemade bread because that's what I do. And I just... Came up with just my own version and I, we had, and my neighbor loved it. And so I really want to do that yeah. again, but I'm not sure where I'm going to be around Mother's Day 2022 because we're trying to move, <laughs> but I'm kind of mentally planning on just doing it wherever I'm at in the hell with it. Like people can well, come and, and can, join you know, me. You can have it as long as you're doing it with what fills your heart. The, the, we often think we need to do it, you know, a celebration of life should be this or it should be that or it's, and the word should is another, you know, get that out of your vocabulary. But when you think of what would the experience be that would fill my heart to remember my mom, to celebrate her in a way that was really joyous and joyful, 
Because what happens, and this is why I want people to really get clear in the caregiving journey about their emotions. When we have an emotion and we tie it to an experience, that's where the memory is created. So a heightened and elevated emotion tied to an experience creates the memory that we store, that we, re that we remember, which is why some things are so profound many, many years later. And so if you create, if you just imagine what would bring me great joy, what would it, what's an experience that mom and I would have enjoyed so much? That's all it needs to be. It doesn't need to be anything. There doesn't need to be a checklist or anything like that. And then you'll have that. You'll have a beautiful, beautiful emotion. You'll create the experience. It'll become a memory. And whenever you think of it, it'll fill your heart with joy for your mom and for you. Well, you're giving me an idea. But the day after she passed away, I reached for the refrigerator handle and immediately an idea popped into my head. Now, my mother, God love her, passed away. Well, my mom was at least the third, second generation. I was the third. Inherited sweet tooth. My mother baked cookies. She made cakes. She was a sugar fiend. And I was too, till I found a specific brain supplement that killed my sweet tooth. There are days I actually miss it. It's kind of annoying. <laughs> it's a good thing, but there are days when it's like... <laughs> I'd, I'd like to know what that supplement is. <laughs> it's Neural Reserves Relevate. My husband is about to start taking it. Because that man has a very significant beer habit. And um, I will send you the link for Relevate. It is. Right. It, it, they have not had other people ex say that they've had that experience. And the only reason that I attribute it to that supplement is on Father's Day this year, 2021. My daughter's got a pretty good sweet tooth as well. I, we were talking about dessert and I realized that I was like, eh, yeah, I made something nice, but eh, if we're full, it's fine. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> like, who Where has invaded my brain? And I'm like, what is going on? This is really weird. Like, I've had nutritionists say, just go cold turkey. And my family's like, no, 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 nope, 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 nope. That will cause murders. Nope, she cannot do that. We will not allow it. And so I was thinking about like, what in my life has changed? Nothing has changed. I've not changed what I've breakfast are the same, lunches. No, I'm like, oh, I've been taking neuro reserve for like six weeks. I'm so I mean, maybe it's psychosomatic. Yeah. I don't know. I did not expect it to do that to me. And trust me, there are evenings where it's like, my brain kind of wants to have something sweet because it's a bad habit. But nah. Which is really strange. It is you. so bizarre. So what I wanted to do for mom's yes. celebration of life, this was April 1st, 2020. So silly me with thinking about a, a celebration of life at the height of COVID. I wanted to do is dessert bar. So we were going to make brownies with frosting, chocolate chip cookies. She liked all these weird like fruit, fruit ring candies, taffies and caramels, which were murder on her teeth. That's what she loved. I'm like, you know, like seriously for like a hundred, 200 bucks, my daughter and I love to bake. We could just bake, you know, like a double batch of chocolate chip cookies, double batch of brownies, buy the other candies, have the diet Coke that my mom consumed at two liter bottles a day. Also not good for your brain. And boom, like I knew that we would not have the same thing we had with my dad. My dad's was like 300 people. It was a big deal. It was a little overwhelming. And so I'm like, I don't want to do that with my mom. And I know that there aren't going to be that many people because she kind of disappeared for three years because she went to the memory care. And, you know, I'm sure people thought about her, but she wasn't part of their social network anymore. And I'm like, you know, we're going to have like 50 people. That'd be great. It'll be so much fun. And of course, that never happened thanks to COVID. But we are going but you could do that. And you'd also think of how much fun it would be if you and your daughter were doing it together. Yeah, that was the plan. And telling stories of your mom. And yeah. But we Maybe are going put a picture of your mom there on the, you mm -hmm. know, if she had a favorite bowl or she had something to put a picture of her and, and have her be part of the experience. I do have a beautiful picture. I took her. She stopped willingly go going. Stop. Ooh, my grammar is not so great there. The salon gal from the assisted living part of the community would go to the memory care, get the ladies who had appointments, bring them back to the salon, do their hair, 
and return them to memory care, which worked great until it didn't. My mom just stopped going. She refused to go. I coached the woman through language to use. Oh, your husband set up this appointment for you. You know, he'd really like it. Um, if I did your hair, would you please come with me now? Okay, fine. And I couldn't coach her through it all the time. So I finally thought, you know what? If you're not going to cooperate, I'm not going to stress about it. I was just so irritated that that this simple little thing just just became a giant challenge. So I was visiting one day and she was kept brushing her hair out of her eyes. And I'm like, that's a sign. I'm so I set up an appointment and it was like the following week. So it was December 9th, 2019. I thought if I have to sit here through this stupid hair appointment, which because she's facing the mirror, she can't see me. So it's like I am just I'm invisible. She didn't know I was there. I'm like, I'm going to at least make this worth my time. So I brought my camera gear with me and made sure to get a re I'm like, she's going to have her hair like professionally blow dry. Yeah. You know? Yeah. When you see this picture and I will link that in the show notes too. So people can see it. You would not know she had Alzheimer's. You would not know that she would be gone in three and a half months. That's because a story. I, Basically harassed, teased her into smiling. Like I literally got, I think five shots, and I wanted a vertical. You're lucky and I wanted, you got that many. It, well, I'm I've been doing that for like a long time. So I I'm, I'm like, <laughs> people bring me their toddlers, and it's like, don't worry, just relax. I will get it. It's okay. Just just go over there and be quiet. Don't tell them to say cheese. I will deal with it. And I've chased little kids around. I've gotten sweaty and dirty. And then their parents are thrilled because there's, you know, a dozen pictures they just love. So yeah. I knew I could do it with my mom. She had on a fall colored shirt that I would not have chosen for portraits, but I was smart enough not to try to get. I'm like, I will find a background that works with that shirt. Because I knew if I the more I fussed about it, the more I made it a production, the less she would be interested in it. So yeah. we went outside. There was some fallish colored trees in the background. Blue sky, some natural light, pop a flash, boom, literally. Two really good ones out of five. Took me about five minutes. That's all That's she great. gave me. And That's I'm great. so grateful that I did that. But yeah. we are going to Yosemite for Christmas. It's a place my mother loved. So I'm going to do something. Because my mom loved Christmas. So you've given me an idea. Thoughts are popping around in my head. But That's for go. another day. We need to talk about how we move from how we go from one transition to another without the angst and the stress and the grief that is pretty common. Yeah. Like, what was it like when you moved, had to move Jack into memory care? When I was l looking at Jack's care. So the, the moment that he was diagnosed from the literally in the doctor's office. And I looked at him and I said, honey, we're starting a new, new chapter in our journey of love. My two goals were for him to be safe and happy. I wanted two things were very, very simple goals that would be the framework for everything that we did. Safe and happy. I've communicated that with every person who's on his care team since then. So everything I do is under the lens of does this help him be safe? And or does this help him be happy? What I recognized is that when I kept him at home, we were doing a great job. He was very social. And so I would get him out all day long. I would take him play. You know, he was a mass everyday Catholic from before he was born. So I would get him to church every morning. I, he had a gentleman's meeting he went to. I had things that we did. So he was constantly being stimulated in ways that supported what he was comfortable with. And over time, when he would have periodically what I would call a dementia moment, when he just wasn't there, he was physically there, but he was like, you know, not there. There were times when I recognized he has the opportunity to do something that if he, in his normal mind, he would not ever want to do. And he's stronger than I am. There's nothing I could do about it. If he fell, you know, I used to, I used to shower with him so that he wouldn't fall. I mean, I you've probably had, you know, had that experience. It was like, you know, he, he didn't know really how to bathe himself that well. And I would, take showers with him. And I realized if he fell, I could not keep him safe. And so what I recognized is that for things to support him, 
He's a very social person. I wanted to find an environment where he could have that. The farther the disease progressed, the harder it became for us to put him in environments where he could have that social stimulation. And if you bring someone into the home, it's like one person. So I recognize that him going into a community for that purpose would be good. And also because I physically was not qualified to, to care for him. So what I began doing a few months before it was going to be at time, it, we, I wanted to put him in it during the Christmas holiday because there'd be, he loves Christmas and there'd be a lot going on. <clears throat> so my plan was that. And so I began training him to sleep alone in bed, to be alone. So there wouldn't be that transition when he first moved there. And for him, as well as for me. So I could be getting peace of mind by learning that he was going to know how to sleep alone when he got there, that he was going to know how to do some of the things and that I was going to have him someplace that would be socially more stimulating. Because I had massive acceptance and radical presence, I had no qualms about moving in him into a community. And when I was looking for communities, I wasn't looking to see if they had the most beautiful chandelier on the wall. I was looking to see how is this community going to support what makes him safe and happy? So it made it really, really easy to transition. And then very quickly, I'll tell you what, what changed that was when Hurricane Irma came in 2017 on September 12th, it was projected to come right up our street, which it did. So we, we, what we did to keep him safe and happy, we went up to Atlanta where uh, children are and Getting him out of that routine was so horrific for him that I recognized that moving him into a community, A, was the right thing to do, and B, that we would accelerate that choice. And yet, I had absolutely no qualms about it because it was to help him be safe and happy, and also for me to have the peace of mind that he was in a place that could help him be safe and happy. That's what I tell people who are struggling with, you know, when do you know it's the right time? to put them in memory care. And my blunt answer is if you're asking it's past time. And then I <laughs> gently <laughs> tell them my mom had friends in memory care. She did things in memory care that she would not do with me. She would not even do certain activities in the community she lived in with me. I don't know what it was with me. I mean, I could have taken that super personally, but apparently her best friend didn't do certain things. I don't know. It was just, it was very strange, but we went yeah. and saw children and then she did other th activities in the community mm -hmm. that she would not have gotten if she'd lived with me. And to live with right. me, I would have had to hire somebody to be with her during the day. So my husband and I could continue our jobs. It could, you know, our daughter had moved out the month before my dad passed away and we put mom in, in memory care. And you were talking about seasons you know, there's seasons where we're cared for and seasons where we're caring. And I personally think there's a season where it's like, excuse me, it's all about me for a little bit of time. I'm going to deal with me. I'll deal with the spouse or whatever. I don't want to deal with other people right now. It's like, yeah, I dealt with my mom. I raised my daughter. I dealt with my mom. You know what? It's my turn. I don't need to be cared for. I mean, other than what I need to take care of myself. And sometimes it feels a little bit selfish because my husband and I have pulled back from some volunteer things where we're in a, a, a little bit of flux in our life right now. It's like crazy, but it'll be all fine because we're, we're, we're finding new paths because mm -hmm. we're focusing on what serves us right. What makes me happy? What do I need to do today to feel like I have a, um, a purpose and like you're connected with your purpose. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, what serves me well? And that, and I think we kind of learned that because of the pandemic. You know, like I said, my mom literally died March 31st, 2020. And then our oldest dog died in November. And then my grandmother died in April. So it literally, it was like less than 54 weeks. I lost all three souls. And there wasn't support groups you could go to. I mean, my, Alzheimer's caregiver support group has been, is still online. It's now down to the same three or four people. And I don't go every month anymore, but it, this, you didn't have like the grief outlets, the coping right. mechanisms because you were stuck in your house. So I just had to figure out yeah. what, what served me. And that's not something I think I would have learned without the pandemic, which 
okay, a little silver lining on that one, but what other what other tips should we talk about before we get too much longer on this today? Yeah, well, one of the things, I'll just share one thing based on what you were talking about. Uh, as I mentioned that I, I've been, you know, doing this for like 35 years and, and with between my grandmother and my father and, and uh, now Jack, it's been continuous. So there's been an overlap with them. And I recognized something and I, I was feeling a weight kind of like you were talking about with some of the, you know, I want to do something. I was feeling kind of a weight and it wasn't a grief thing. And it wasn't, I couldn't really put my hand on a uh, handle on it. And then one day when I was leaving the care facility after visiting Jack, I just sat in the car and I said, you know, I'm not depressed. I don't, I'm not, I, I don't want to not be doing this for care. I don't feel resentful. I don't feel any of this. What is going on? And I recognized that I had something that I've caught, I've coined journey fatigue. And there comes a point in time where acknowledging, hey, you know what? It's okay to say, even though I want to stay in the journey, I'm not trying to get out. The journey is going to continue. And I know that I'm fatigued. I could use a break. It's been a long journey. And just the fact of recognizing it and owning it allowed me then to give myself permission to say, what would help me not have that fatigue of the journey and yet stay on the journey? And so I did some things to kind of help with that. But that's kind of like, you know, you weren't being selfish. You were really recognizing that you, when you, you know, uh, a gentleman named John Gray, and one of the books he wrote was um, How to Get What You Want and Want What You Have. And he talked about our buckets. And when we keep emptying our buckets, there comes upon there's there's nothing left. And when we're giving, especially as caregivers, and we give and we give and we choose to and we give and we give and we give and we give, we have to find ways to fill our buckets back up. Because when we've de completely depleted it, and there's nothing else, nobody else can fill that for us. We've got to be able to, to, to take back and this is one of the reasons why self care intentional self-care is so important from very, very early in our journey. It's self-care, not selfish. And when we have that, then we recognize things and we're able to give ourselves permission to care for ourselves. So we don't have the kind of burnout that a lot of people have because they just keep giving and giving and giving and they've got nothing, nothing left to give. And that's where resentments come in. I can, I can understand that. That's a really good way of, I don't want to say thinking about it, but it's, I guess that's the right phrase. Cause I did feel resentful sometimes, but I think a lot of it, I, I think after hearing what you're talking about, I do think it was journey fatigue because I had been dealing with my mom's Alzheimer's since at least 2000 when we still had our family business and I had to quote unquote supervise her. So she would, she would frequently take orders with no directions. And I was really not liking having to call people and try to fake my way through a, oh, well, I'm not really sure what mom's written down here. Can you clarify what you was yeah. like? Because I didn't want to embarrass her. Right. Um, but yeah, cause it's like, there was time I did, I felt resentful and I'm not really sure. I mean, I know what I thought then, but after hearing what you said, I think it was journey fatigue. It was just like, I just don't want to have to deal with this anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's fair. I mean, I've been, you know, it is 17 fair. years. You give yourself permission. You, you, it's, it's giving yourself permission. And again, this is, this is why I talk so much about raising things to our level of awareness. It's fair to be fatigued. It's fair to be like, it's fair for all of those things to be part of our experience. We don't need to feel bad about it. And there are people who experience it in silence because they're afraid that somebody else might judge them or they're afraid they would be a failure or they would be letting somebody else down. And so instead of embracing somebody else, being able to help them figure out ways to fill their bucket or perhaps sharing it so that neighbors or loved ones could come in and could give a little additional support that they didn't know would be beneficial they're, they're, they're not allowing that to happen. So give yourself permission to go ahead and experience it and share it and, and, you know, own it. I mean, I owned it and I, I feel so 
much better once I recognized what it was. And then I said to myself, you know, I'm clear on the journey. I am in this. I just adore my husband. I love him to pieces. What do I do to fill myself back up so I have joy, I can be present, and, and I don't feel the weight of the fatigue of the journey? And I makes- figured it out, and I do it. So well, it's self-care, not selfish. That is very true. So I highly recommend, if you guys liked this conversation, that you get Sue's book, Our Journey of Love, Five Steps to Navigating Your Caregiving Journey. Because once again, I'm learning all kinds of good things. And the only thing I can do with them is to share them because my mom is gone and I have nobody to care for right now. My husband knows because he's a foot taller than me. You get some sort of cognitive disease, you will be living somewhere else. Because I. I can't take care. I mean, he's much bigger than I am. This is not going to happen. And he doesn't like, he's, he's a lot like my mom. Like, I don't want help. I can do it myself. Well, when you can't do it yourself, then you got to have somebody to help you. And that's, that was the challenge that we went with my mom. So I can only share all this good information at this point and, and hope that I don't have to use it again. (laughs) But this has been really great. I'm glad Thank that you, you uh, don't have any hurricanes barreling down your street in the near future. Let's let's hope the next the, the next letters in the alphabet don't choose to to come down. But yeah, so think, this is as you can tell, this is what I'm passionate about, and I I'm passionate about speaking about it. I I coach individuals and groups and families, and I teach the course and. I have all different ways that if people want to get an additional deep dive into what I do, I'm glad to share because I wouldn't have this where I'm at if there hadn't been a lot of people. I'm sure you'd say the same thing. If people hadn't poured into us, if you weren't continuing to pour into other people, you know, we wouldn't be able to get to where we are now. So I thank you so very, very, very much that one of the things that you did is instead of when your journey ended with your mom, you could have turned the light off, turned around and moved away. And yet it called to you to give to others and to continue to do that and deepen that. So thank you very much for what you're doing. I am humbled by the opportunity to be learning from you. Awesome. Well, I think you and I are planning on maybe a YouTube episode where we're doing card crafting, right? Card crafting. Exactly. Awesome. So you guys will have to look forward to that. That'll probably be just a YouTube episode, but I thank you and I look forward to our crafting day. Yes, I do too. Wonderful. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.